Welcome to Conversations with Keith. I'm Keith Lockhart, the conductor of the Boston Pops, and this is my chance to introduce you to some of the people on the stage and behind the scenes who make the Boston Pops America's Orchestra. Those of you who are fans of holiday pops will probably find what you're about to hear delightfully familiar. You're probably less familiar with the composer-arranger who brought these seasonal sounds to Symphony Hall. The International Broadway Database <laughs> says that David Chase is credited as lyricist, composer, arranger, musical director, musical supervisor, conductor, and musician. Well, that's a lot of hats. But around the Boston Pops, we just know him as Mr. Christmas. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, David Chase. Hey, David. Nice. Hey, Keith. <laughs> nice to see you here. You have a career on Broadway that goes, well, it spans over a quarter century. I think your first show on Broadway was Damn Yankees in 94? 94, that's right. I actually, the original music director was a gentleman named James Raitt, who is a fantastic musician and a good friend. Um, and the, uh, the person who basically said to me, I never had dreams of conducting, which I think is very different from, from your background. <laughs> um, but, I have uh, nightmares about it. <laughs> But uh, no, I, would, I had been playing piano for a while in various venues, and, and James basically looked at me and said, you should be a conductor. Um, and it was a very unique situation because at the time he was actually quite ill with AIDS, and, and he had been asked to be the music director and the arranger for Damn Yankees um, based on Forever Plaid, which he had done which was also set around the same time frame. So a lot of you who know Forever Plaid, which is for four singers and a pianist and a bass, James Raitt was the original arranger of that. And when Damn Yankees came up, uh, I had been playing Forever Plaid and he just said to me, hey, you should be a conductor and I'm not gonna be around. And, and uh, so it was a huge gift. And I, I actually still conduct with his baton. That's, that's really wonderful. What a, what a great legacy. What a great thing to give. How, what got you there? Were you kind of like I was, a kind of big music theater geek growing up? Uh, not really. Uh, I think the sort of the, the interest in music theater came starting towards the end of ninth grade. Uh, my mother actually picked up a high school student she saw walking along the side of the road. And my mother being my mother and being able to chat with everybody and at any time about anything, uh, engaged with him, took him, picked him up, and that sounds bad now, I guess, um, but uh, gave him a ride home, and, and he talked about how much he loved the theater department and the theater teacher, and uh, so she came home and said, oh, you should get involved with that, and I was like, okay. Um, so I ended up mostly being a performer during high school and through most of college, even though even in high school I was doing some arranging, I just didn't know that's what it was called. When you say a performer, you mean on, you mean an on stage performer? On stage, yes. I, I made my debut as uh, Freddie Einsford Hill in My Fair Lady in 1981 in Fairfax, Virginia. So um, well, you went you went to Harvard. Uh, I did. One, pres one presumes you didn't go to Harvard because you were looking for a career on Broadway. It's not the usual path. No, that is true. Although it's more common now, but at the time, I mean, I always said that Harvard. You know, Harvard, which comes out of the, that Puritan tradition, does not believe in music or theater or any form of entertainment or joy or anything like that. <laughs> um, which is You're an excellent advertisement, yeah. this, by the way. <laughs> um, actually, here's a side note, which is that, you know, some people talk about, like, what inspired them. Here's something that despired me. I don't know if that's a word, but I just invented it. <laughs> Um, which is that at the Harvard graduation uh, in 1986, Derek Bach, who was president, got up and said, I hope that you all make the arts your first avocation. Oh. Which I actually took as a deep insult, and that's kind <laughs> of why I had to go into the arts, because I wanted <laughs> to have it as a vocation, not an avocation. Um, but no, if anything, what Harvard did was say, hey, if you want to try something, then do it. And, uh, and I fell into... Uh, 
working, doing a lot of stuff with the Hasty Pudding. I was on stage for several years. Uh, I think you might actually have a picture I, of that. I think we have a picture of that, uh -huh. and if we do, I certainly hope we share it. But at Harvard, yes, I have a degree in biology, which basically means I know nothing about anything except a little bit more about living things, um, <laughs> all of which I've forgotten at this point. And, but I knew how to play piano, and I liked playing piano, and I liked singing, and I liked music. And so I got involved in the Hasty Pudding, which was, for those who don't know, which is probably nobody in Boston, I guess, um, is an original show that's student-written. And, and I, did, I wrote the music and some of the lyrics, um, did it for three different shows, and never really wanted to be a composer per se. I actually enjoyed more making pastiche things and saying, oh, how, do you, how does somebody like, make a song like that sound like that? And playing around and, and doing, doing interesting things that I thought were interesting, but not because I wanted to be a composer, just because I could. And it well, was- You fun. know, the pastiche thing uh, mm -hmm. is fascinating because, well, I mean, how many shows between Broadway, big regional productions, that sort of thing, how many shows have you been associated with in the last quarter century? Well. Broadway, I'm, the number of shows I've worked on, uh, original productions, which includes revivals, about almost 40 at this point. Um, and then a bunch of shows on the West End, a bunch of shows that, that started out headed to Broadway but never made it there or played regionally and never went beyond that. Um, but I actually, I, I also wear a couple of other secret hats, like I, I have a whole semi-career writing choral music which has nothing to do with Broadway, except that it's still kind of like feeding the same thing. And uh, lately I've been doing more like TV orchestrating. Why? Well, I don't know. <laughs> because you can, you know? Because, you know, but the versatility of talent. I mean, we've, we've, mm -hmm. uh, the, the pops, we've worked together mm -hmm. mostly with you as an arranger, uh, mm -hmm. bringing new things and new ways of looking at old things to us. Uh, but of course we shared the stage for, I think one of my biggest artistic thrills mm -hmm. in 25 years, which was the incredible production of On the Town that we put together with Kathleen Marshall. director on that production I was the conductor because for people who don't know the mm -hmm. difference in this case this involved many many hours of you rehearsing with Kathleen and the cast which is something I couldn't mm -hmm. do because I was stuck in the middle of uh, the pop season at that time and then you were kind enough to play the piano part uh, during the actual performance which made you practice more than I think you had <laughs> yes. in a couple of years. Yes, I, I would say foolish enough to play the piano <laughs> part because I, I would be the last person to say that I'm a pianist. I, I like to say that I'm a storyteller and music is my tool. Obviously, any great arranger has compositional chops mm -hmm. of some level, but it's a matter of motivation. It's a matter of whether you have, whether the, your primary mm -hmm. interest is working out ideas you have in your own head, or as you said, you like looking at how other things are put together. People well, all the time ask me if mm -hmm. I'm if I'm a composer because I followed John Williams, so they assume that that's mm -hmm. a necessary thing. And I said, I have practical composition chops. And if you say, write me 16 bars to get me from this uh, from the end of this mm -hmm. piece to the beginning of this one, I could do that. But I, I even less than you, I have mm -hmm. no interest in uh, in putting my ideas out on the page. I'd, I'd much rather take other people's ideas and try to make them work for another audience. Well. I think that's a great observation, which is, and I, you know, this is not, this is not the biologist speaking, 
but I will sound like a biologist and maybe you'll believe me, I don't know, um, which is that I am utterly convinced that there are probably two almost unrelated centers of, of how we hear music in our brain. Um, and one is essentially as, as a, the same way we hear math, which is all about balance and equality and equations. And if you have four beats in this bar, then you need four beats in that bar that, you know, or if you have a rising line, it's answered by a falling line or if any, any of those things that become like arranging tools. And that's very different than hearing music as a language where you're actually simply listening to the flow of it and in the middle of it at all times and not necessarily thinking about it as something which has balance or, or equivalences. Um, and I, I think most, for example, like most people that, that do go into improv as jazz players think more in terms of language. Now, obviously all of us who are professional musicians draw from both of those sides of our brain, but I get much more joy, I think, out of finding sort of, you know, taking puzzle pieces and like trying, does it work this way? Does it work that way? What happens if you like turn something on its head? Those are the fun things. Well, and you know, you've, you've conducted a number of notable productions and worked as music supervisor, which is pretty, pretty much the setup uh, person for people who are for mm -hmm. shows that are going out, things like that. But I think the majority of your credits are for arranging, particularly for dance arranging. Correct. And uh, I think this is interesting for, for people who aren't Broadway insiders. Um, people think that the composer wrote all the music that you hear when you hear a show. Mm -hmm. Most uh, composers, and this is no denigration to them, most of the composers who write for Broadway are songwriters. Uh, they write songs, uh, you know, they write themes mm -hmm. and songs, they put those together, but then there's an immense amount of music in terms of orchestration, for one thing, because it's one thing to play it on piano and another thing mm -hmm. to hear how it should be voiced within a group of an orchestra and, and what kind of what kind of timbres you want to project. But also, um, there are uh, moments where those themes are used and spun out sometimes endlessly. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's true that you know, a, a metaphor that I sometimes use with people is that a composer is, is somebody who essentially says, I imagine a tree. And if that's all they say, that's all they say. And then you as the arranger are the one to say, okay, I'm going to draw you a black and white sketch of a tree. And because you didn't give me much information, I have to decide, is it a pine tree? Is it an oak tree? Is it on a mountainside? Is it, is it winter? Is it summer? Is it you know, are there other trees around it? All of those sort of decisions are ranging decisions. And then to take the metaphor one step further, the orchestrator is a person who then decides what color it is or how, how it's painted. Um, but, a, you know, a really full service composer is going to give you huge amounts of information. Um, and to me, the greatest sort of compliment as an arranger is for an audience not to realize that I did anything is to think that the composer wrote everything and think that it sounds exactly like what the composer would have written if, you know, I work with a lot of dead composers because I do a lot of revivals um, and they certainly don't fight back as much. Um, <laughs> they're, but They're much more convenient know, that way. <laughs> they're much more convenient, you know, they have less to say. <laughs> so what mm -hmm. were you working on uh, when our world, meaning our performing artist world, uh, crashed to a halt? Um, several things. We were about to start a, uh, a pre-Broadway workshop for a re another revival of The Music Man starring Hugh Jackman that I'm doing dance music for. Um, also working on a production, a revival of 1776, which would, would have been at the ART in Cambridge right now. Um, and that has currently uh, been pushed into next season for the ART and fingers crossed that that all comes together. Um, and then another thing that I'll mention is was an off-Broadway show called The Bedwetter, which was based on Sarah Silverman's... Nappy title, yeah. Nappy title, <laughs> yes. Based, based on so Sarah Silverman's um, memoir. I mean, uh, this is the longest I have ever gone without uh, making music for an audience, a public, in a live setting. Since I started being a musician, this is 40 years, basically, at this point. And uh, it's, it's very, it's hard. I mean, you, you, you question your own self-worth, especially as a conductor. I've been playing a little mm -hmm. bit more, uh, which is coming kind of rustily and creakily forward because you've got to do something. You've got you to express yourself. You've got to mm -hmm. play. But conductors are, are the world's 
least useful thing at a point mm-hmm. like this because our voice is entirely dependent on many other voices all being together in tight knit community. And without them, you're nothing. I think we as human beings have a need to congregate. And I think we have a need to form community, a, not just a community, but I, I specifically said we need to have a need to form community, um, which is somehow to be able to share in real time our emotional experiences. I think you're right. I think obviously all of us who are performers have a need that we have to fulfill. But mm-hmm. the reason, but you know, that's fine. They'd say, well, isn't that great? You've got a hobby. But uh, right. in, An terms avocation. Of, yeah. in terms of the reason that people will continue to come and to pay money to have these experiences is about, I think, a need for community and a need also to share some sort of emotional stimulus, emotional stimuli together. One of the things I like most about one of your most recent arrangements for us, uh, which is an arrangement, uh, tell us a little bit about um, uh, Home for the Holidays, which you combined more than one uh, tune Mm -hmm. into something that I thought was really a lovely gesture. And we've been using it as what I call the benediction, which is the the, uh, Mm -hmm. thing the benediction is what sends you out into the streets. And it's, it's very important to me that people get sent out to the streets with a certain message that I hope touch them. I think that real life is not, is not simple. It's not, uh, it's not something that like suddenly you're happy, then suddenly you're sad. It, it's, it's, the, it's in those transitions between emotional states that the drama is created and that, that life happens. So what was fun about home for the holidays is, taking some songs which were which we have a warm feeling about like that song but also throwing in then i started thinking about okay what other home songs are there and even though nobody thinks about home from the whiz as being a holiday song it just seemed like the sentiment was right and the mood of it was right and so not that hearing the juxtaposition juxtaposition of that is going to make you laugh out loud, but hopefully it makes you smile in the way that you realize that, okay, the sentiment of wanting to be home is, is universal and comes in all forms and wanting to be back to a place uh, uh, that you remember and where you feel safe. And uh, there's even, I, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I actually, actually quote over the rainbow in like, two bars uh, in one of the transitions in a way that's very, it's subtle and I'm not even sure most people would hear it, but it makes me smile, so. Well, let's hear a little bit of it. Okay. Thank you for that, by the way. That's, uh, it's just simply, it's a gorgeous arrangement. And uh, I, you know, I, you. when I were doing that during the season, I do it probably 45, 46 times. Mm-hmm. And it's, mm-hmm. it's still very, very affecting. But not only that, it's, it's also really well crafted. And I think that's, that's the combination and why we, why we keep coming back to you. And I think very few composers or writers, uh, uh, playwrights, very few of them say, I'm going to write this for all eternity and not for now. Uh, (laughs) How does music and theater, how do they age over time? How does, how does meaning shift? How can um, 
how can music or theater retain relevance over a period of time? Well, I don't know that anything, this is a big statement, I don't know that anything retains relevance. I think relevance keeps being reapplied. So that if something is a really strong piece of writing, whether it's theater or straight play, I mean, a straight play or a musical or a piece of music, it's, we keep coming back to it because we, in our modern moment, keep finding relevance. So, you know, to me, the, one of the great examples is Oklahoma in, in its original state is a World War II musical, even though it's not set in World War II, but it debuted in 1943. And I'm convinced that what made it successful more than anything else was I know we belong to the land and the land, or we know we belong to the land and the land we belong to is grand. So it was a patriotic statement. It was, um, well, patriotic to the point of jingoistic, actually. Hammerstein later almost felt it was too patriotic. And if you really think about the story, it's a story of a community pulling together, uh, you know, the farmer and the cowman should be friends and that we shouldn't internally fight. We've got bigger battles to fight out there. And we need to apply rules to our community and we need to, you know, and this is, gets a little dark this way, but Judd doesn't play by the rules. Therefore, he needs to be shunned by the community. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you have to, like, if you see the show in the context of the World War II uh, cultural moment, then you understand it a certain way. If you're not seeing it that way, you have to understand it in your own way for your own cultural moment. I'm going to bring it back to something you were talking about a few minutes ago, which is we, you know, what is theater going to feel like? What is music going to feel like in, after this whole experience with the quarantine and the, and everything. And it's interesting. I think, you know, theater and film in the thirties, for example, during the depression was all escapism. It was all, let's take it, let's get on a, on a, cross uh, Atlantic ship ride with Fred Astaire where he, where he dresses up in top hat and white tie and tails and dances with Ginger Rogers while most people are struggling with the depression. So that's how, that's what they wanted to see in the thirties. They wanted to see that kind of escapism post nine 11 where almost all the shows that were successful had a sense of, don't worry, we're just being silly right now. We're just being goofy. We're not really feeling emotion. So if you look at things like, you know, the producers, which opened before that, but it, that's when it really started to thrive. Um, or, or you're in town, or even the way that Thoroughly Modern Millie is written is with a sense of being able to stand back and having a little distance from the emotional content. A lot of what contextually makes Hamilton not only brilliant, but particularly meaningful is the line, immigrants, we get the job done. And it hit just at the moment when that was part of the national conversation. So I think in 20 or 30 years, people will look back and hopefully wonder why that line got, gets huge applause every time it's said. They'll appreciate the brilliance of the show without necessarily understanding why that line was so unique. Even in classical music, even Beethoven's Ninth, I think, are you really doing it now the way that he did it? I mean, aren't you, aren't vibratos different? Isn't phrasing different? Aren't tempos Everything slightly different. different? It's all different. It's all, and the, it, the venue is, the venue yeah. is different. The audience is different. Nobody is selling snacks down the aisles during the slow right. Uh There are all sorts uh -huh. of, you know, and we tend to um, try to encase these things in lucite and say, this is the way they've all mm -hmm. always been like, put them on the wall in a museum. And mm -hmm. that's, a real disservice. I mean, people ask me to address all the time, what is it that makes, we use that horrible word, classical <laughs> music, but what makes something classic? And I think what makes something classic, whether it's a Beatles song or, uh, or Mozart 40, um, is that it continues to speak to mm -hmm. generations far removed from the ones it was intended for. That, um, and yes, there's that hundreds people. and hundreds, thousands of pieces of music that were written contemporaneously with the pieces we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And there are hundreds of Broadway shows that were written at the same time that Oklahoma was too. Those largely have been uh, consigned to the scrap heap because they don't mean anything to people and they don't speak to them. You know, the theater is certainly full of pieces that 
that have been deemed unrevivable until they get revived and suddenly are big hits. I mean, mm -hmm. Diane Paulus's production of Hair, Hair was something that, you know, seemed very relevant in 1969 when it opened because it was yeah. all about Vietnam. And seemed but, very dated now. Looking and seemed at very, it. But all it took was another war to come back uh, and, and suddenly it has relevance. And a lot of it just has to do with the moment in time in which we view it and finding new relevance. But I don't want to get too heavy. Not that, no. we have, not that we maybe a little late for that, late. but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, just a quick and quick and fun stuff that people might not know about you. For mm -hmm. one, uh, you are uh, you're part of a, a show business marriage. Tell us just a little bit about your uh, your your spouse and your family. Okay, well, my wife Paula Leggett Chase uh, has done ten Broadway shows, and in fact, was just nominated for a Drama Desk this year um, for a what she did in an off-Broadway revival of Unsinkable Molly Brown, directed by Kathleen Marshall. So Paula uh, and I met doing a production of A Chorus Line. Uh, that was, she had actually been in the, not the original Broadway cast, but the original Broadway production in the last year of, of A Chorus Line in 1989-90. Um, and then we met uh, in 91, when there was a production in at the Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey, and she, got a call because they lost somebody at the last minute. And uh, the I was the associate music director and the music director was out of town. So she had to come over and sing for me and make a tape to send to him. Uh, and uh, that's when we met. And then we started dating maybe about a year later when she was in the original company of, Cor of uh, Crazy For You, uh, which opened in 92. Um, and then we started dating, got married uh, in 92. And, That's uh, uh, show business serendipity. Show business serendipity. <laughs> um, and then we have two two kids, one of whom is uh, right now working on Wall Street from his from the bedroom over there, um, and the other, which is finishing freshman year of NYU, doing music technology. So kind of in the family business, but a little little different side of it. <laughs> well, that's 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 probably good because that's also easier to do mm -hmm. remotely than what either of us do. This is definitely true. Uh, favorite. Favorite food, favorite restaurant, favorite night out? Uh, well, I guess those are sort of three separate things. The, they are. If, but if I was I, hoping you compress them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I, you know, because I don't know that, okay, if I said favorite food, it would be either salmon, broccoli, or blueberries, but not together. Mm. Um, well, salmon with broccoli as a side is. Salmon great. with broccoli as a side, that works. Um, favorite, uh, favorite restaurant? Well, the, the one that, the family loves to go to, so it's sort of our, our New York favorite, is a place called uh, the Korean Mill, which was is a Columbia spot that used to be a, a like just a regular diner and sold lime rickies. This is back in the like 60s or 70s. Um, and then a Korean family took it over and now serves Korean food, but they still have lime rickies. Oh, that's cool. Um, so, <laughs> You're making now, me really, really miss the, uh, the dining out experience. Yeah. What would you be <laughs> if uh, if fate and the Harvard commencement address had not driven you to Broadway? Well, I would not be a doctor because one of the reasons I got a biology degree is because I thought I was going to be a doctor. And uh, I very quickly realized that that wasn't for me. Um, even though my dad is an MD, retired, but he was never a clinician. So I never saw that side of it. And once I saw that side, I went, not for me. Um, but from this vantage point, if I could do anything else, I would love to be a professional philologist. Wow. What? <laughs> uh, because I love words. Mm -hmm. I love the why of words. I love the how of words. I love the, the history, the, con the context. It's actually not really any different than what I do now. I just marry it with music. Yes, you know, I knew there was a reason I liked you. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so um, we're going to close uh, with um, the piece of work most familiar by uh, mm. David Chase's to our audiences. And uh, that is something I tell the story all the time. Uh, I tell them that I now know what <laughs> Arthur Fiedler felt like when he opened up the package and Sleigh Ride was in there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a mixed thing because on one hand you go, this is a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you go, I am never going to be rid of this masterpiece. <laughs> my, my staff and I have built just an incredible library of really great 
holiday music, mm -hmm. uh, different moods, different traditions, different cultures, different styles, but uh, so that we can very easily rotate this material, add in a couple of things each time, and, and just really have you know, wonderful programs and with music that is uniquely ours, that, that no one else has. Um, and for years, I've known that, that we needed to have some way to address the 12 days of Christmas problem. Now, the 12 days of Christmas problem, for those of you who are not familiar with this problem, is that the 12 days of Christmas, everybody knows the 12 days of Christmas. It is, however, the 99 bottles, bottles of beer yes, so well. of holiday music, uh, because there's really nothing you can do with it. It's endlessly repetitive, or so we thought. Uh, it's endlessly repetitive. Um, and for years, ever since I got into this business, I have been sent uh, sample scores by other composers who had a new, quote, witty, unquote, take <laughs> on the 12 days of Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, and they fell so flat. But knowing you and knowing your work, mm -hmm. I just kind of threw it out one day. I said, do you think you could do something with the 12 days of Christmas, David? And David, uh, you know, kind of went away. We didn't really hear very much about but, it. Wait. And, that, yes. that was only half the request. <laughs> it what wasn't was just, other? could you do something? It was, could it you good? do, well, <laughs> could you do something that's never been done before? <laughs> well, so, by that I meant anything of quality. <laughs> <yeah>. Okay, fair. <laughs> and and what, what came back to us was, um, without a doubt, one of the most uh, endlessly imaginative uh, uh, takes on anything uh, that I've <laughs> ever seen. Uh, witty, fresh, humorous, uh, appealing to and gettable by a really wide range of potential audience members, which is what we see in there. Uh, there's, there's a term in, in a Broadway term called mm -hmm. showstopper. Uh, a showstopper mm -hmm. is a moment um, in the show that intentionally or unintentionally, uh, the audience uh, makes enough of a racket, they jump to their feet, they scream, they shout, they ask for a curtain call, whatever, uh, in a way that totally mm -hmm. disrupts the narrative flow of the show. Uh, there is no doubt that the David Chase version of The 12 <laughs> Days of Christmas is a showstopper. And before we play it for you, I just thought maybe a, a couple words about that. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to expect something still better than, uh, than that from you at some point. <laughs> I'm, tr I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> So that's, you, you say that's a yoke around your neck that, you know, you're stuck with the rest of your life that, you know, that's the next challenge is how do you, what else is there after, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know. A kitchen after, I don't know. Like that one. A kitchen, <laughs> yeah. Cause, cause once you've used the idea, the basic idea, I don't know that you can do it again. Um, I mean, that arrangement came about, you know, I, I remember when you asked that and it's, it is one of those songs that when I see it on you know, a bill for something, I just, I groan, I groan, I groan, I groan. Um, and, but I knew that, okay, how do, how do you make this one different or, or unique? And I, I couldn't tell you what initially sparked going down this route, but it certainly was, it was great fun. Some things were very obvious. Uh, and I think the audience appreciates the obvious things like the five golden rings being Beethoven's fifth. I think part of the challenge then to me was they can't all be super obvious. You have to have, and again, it's, it's that thing about how do you keep surprising an audience, especially with a song that they think they know everything that's going to happen. Um, the, other, <laughs> the other interesting challenge is I wanted to make sure that every piece was in the correct key as well. Um, and of course, the Overture to Magic Flute is in E flat and the, uh, the final march is in D. So one of the, you know, I spent a long time, I remember, trying to figure out how to get from E, go down a half step in a, in a way that kind of made sense. Um, things like that. You know, but to me, that's the puzzle. That's the how do you figure it out and how do you, when you arrive at the place where people suddenly know where they are, because you, you knew what was great is that then the, uh, I can't remember the name of the march, because it's not a Sousa march. It's the... Uh, oh, oh, it's, uh, it's uh, the National Emblem. The National Emblem March. Yeah. Um, you know, fortunately, that is in the same key as the Hallelujah Chorus. And so that probably came out of the fact that, oh, well, good, that's in that key. Okay, that's a good way to end this. Why not? Um, and, 
you know, the fact that hallelujah and true love have enough consonances and assonances in the, the, the phrase that they can kind of go together, you know, things like that. Those just little, little things. Uh, I will say the one day that was hardest by far, can you guess? Six. Um. No, because, because with geese, there are options. Oh, that's right. And you went for you went you went for Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma, so this, yeah. <laughs> so this, no, I give up. Okay, it's it's four because there aren't very many songs about calling or calling birds. Um, certainly, so that well, is you put pr- you put that awful telephone gag in later on. Right? Yes, well, <laughs> you know, because things have to again, like it's a, like a good detective story where you kind of like have to plant some clues that pay off later. Yeah. So you went to so you went to Indian Love Call mm-hmm. and uh, Indian Love Call, which I think mo- okay. So now we'll talk about cultural context. I would Nelson say, McDonald. Uh, Nelson, uh, Nelson, 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 Nelson met into that McDonald. Right? Yes, which was a huge song. 80 years ago, but nobody, but very few people know it now. And if I could have found another song, I might've used it, uh, but I didn't. So that's what you're stuck with. It is as, as much as you can say within this sort of um, creation, uh, it is, it is a absolutely masterful work. It's a work, it's a work of genius. Uh, and uh, we'll start, we'll, we'll, we'll keep on you until you come uh, to, <laughs> I mean, you've done so many great things for us, but uh, it, it, it does stand kind of lit by its own light, I think. And uh, thank you, David, for um, all you've done for us. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, I look forward to um, joining with you and others uh, in the fight to make sure that uh, we're still there. We, we to need to congregate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we need, to have, we need to have our communal event, our community. Yeah. So, so thank you. And we're going to go out now right. with the the as i as i introduce it every time <laughs> ladies and gentlemen the world's best ever 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 version of the 12 days of christmas
Thank you for watching Conversations with Keith. To see more musician-created content, visit bostonpops.org slash at home. Don't miss the next video by hitting subscribe. We'll see you next time. Keep the music playing. Scan this QR code image with your smartphone's camera app to donate today.